Hey everyone, welcome to the Being Patient Podcast. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. When my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I decided to use my skills as a journalist in a different way. Frustrated by the lack of information on science and the inability to get different expert opinions, I decided to quit my job at the Wall Street Journal to create a better platform for people impacted by dementia. We are a community where news and information is created by our team of journalists. We ask tough questions and we simplify the science so that anyone can understand. We don't only cover disease, but delve into the latest research on what it takes to keep our brains healthy. We invite the experts and ask your questions. Here's today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Um, as many of you know, as much as we cover the research behind Alzheimer's and other dementias, we also delve into the topic of brain health. So we thought today we would focus on fasting. Um, of course, a lot of you have heard about or practice fasting. It's gotten very popular today. So we thought we would revisit the topic um, with Professor Walter Longo. He is at USC. He is the founder of the Fasting Mimicking Diet Prolon. Walter, very good to see you and thanks so much for joining us again. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, so, you know, since the last time we spoke, I, uh, you know, decided why not? I'm going to practice a couple of um, uh, prolons uh, for five days. For those of you who don't know, fasting mimicking is you're, you're following a strict program where you're having um, few calories enough to trick your body into thinking that it's fasting. So I decided to try it. I've done it twice now. Um, and, you know, I found it really hard, but to be, if I'm very honest, I felt really good at the end, you know, when I, when it was hard to get through the five days, but then I think, wow, I feel really great. I had a lot of energy um, and just felt like I really had a reset. What's happening, Walter? I'm going to back up for those people who aren't that familiar with fasting. What's happening inside our bodies to make us really actually feel better by depriving ourselves of food for a limited period of time? Yeah. So, so we come from a history of uh, uh, having lots of food in the summer or whenever that was, the food was available and becoming insulin resistant, right? So the body becomes resistant to insulin and accumulates fat. And it's doing that because, and this is still happens, for example, in the emperor penguins in the South Pole, right? So they, they become large and potentially obese. And then they eventually don't eat for a couple of months. And uh, yeah, so then uh, um, the, those couple of months uh, that we used to have now never come. And, um, and so, yeah, so then what happens in the fasting uh, uh, is that the body um, goes back to this winter mode, right? And so it becomes insulin sensitive again, it's burning fat. Uh, uh, but also we've, we've done a lot of work, uh, in, particularly in mice, but also a lot of clinical trials now and, and the, the mouse work very clearly shows this uh, shrinking um, elimination of lots of damaged components during the starvation period, let's say. But then the stem cells and other programs go to work. And when the food comes back around, it's a really remarkable uh, regenerative program that has the job of bringing the organs uh, and systems back to the ideal condition. So in this uh, uh, fasting refeeding cycles, we see lots of evidence for fairly sophisticated embryonic-like program that fixes uh, lots of things that are, that, that are wrong with the system. Yeah. Okay, let's start with, I mean, there's a lot, inflammation, cellular damage, all of that. Um, but I want to go back a little bit about to the biological history of this, because it could this happen to have um, a maybe our bodies are meant this way because we we started as hunters and gatherers where we would eat and then not eat for a long time is there any historical association that we know of that we're just as human beings not programmed to eat all the time and like actually in spurts is is better for us 
Yeah, I mean, of course, it's hard to to know what happened twenty thousand years ago, uh, but I but again, I think we see it with the animals uh, surrounding us in various regions, particularly those where food uh, may be more like it used to be, right? So, so let's say the South Pole, or or you know, or or the or the North Pole, or like the northern areas of Canada where some of the bears are, and uh, yeah, so then. It's almost it, it's difficult to imagine how you will have food all the time, uh, and um, and so it's very very likely. And this is why hibernation came came around, right? So yeah, hibernation is basically an evolu uh, evolution of, of a program that that allows you to uh, um, deal with a complete starvation, uh, a long starvation period. And yeah, so that, I think that that's where we come from very clearly. I mean, most organisms in the world are in starvation conditions. You know, this was my early days uh, work uh, with bacteria and yeast and, and they're called stationary phase, right? And, or sporulation state. So most microorganisms, uh, which represent most organisms in the world uh, are starving most of the time. And once in a while, they get the food, they grow very rapidly, and then they go back to starving potentially for years, right? So. So I think that's um, that's that's also a very different version of that, but it's also our history. So when you fast, there is something that's called, is it um, autophagy? Is that how I say it? Autophagy? That autophagy. Goes on, yeah, that goes on on the cellular level. Tell us, I mean, that's kind of cleaning out things that don't need to be there in, and rebalancing. Tell us a little bit on the cellular level, what's happening when we deprive ourselves uh, of food for a specific amount of time, yeah. So, so there are lots of processes. Autophagy is is uh, one of them, um, and uh, and autophagy happens at the cellular level, and so the cell basically um, goes through a shrinking process itself, right? So the organism shrinks, and lots of things happen, but. But at the cell level, uh, the the cell shrinks and and um, and basically eats uh, its own components. So some of the organelles are broken down, lots of the proteins and and uh, um, and other uh, micromolecules are broken down. And the and of course the purpose is to use them for fuel, uh, but also to have less uh, uh, to have less uh, mass to worry about, right? So if a, if a cell is large. It has to consume more energy, so it eats itself and it becomes smaller. Um, so that now you have, uh, uh, you know, you you also consume less fuel, um, and uh, and and both of them are important to uh, to surpass this uh, fasting period. So, um, with your your research, your latest research on disease prevention, and uh, especially in particular Alzheimer's disease. What is the link? Why is it like I know it's really on uh, are, are you only really in the animal um, like mouse studies um, stage of, of research or have you tested on humans yet? No, no, for Alzheimer's, we're almost uh, done with the clinical trial um, in Perugia, University of Perugia, University of Genova, and uh, I think this was uh, 60 patients and uh, doing uh, a monthly fasting mimicking diet. And also doing um, because we were worried about the the age of the patients, um, doing a, a daily supplement, sort of a ketogenic, sort of high fat uh, uh, supplement. And and thus far, I I think that uh, it's going better than we expected as far as compliance. I mean, we thought you know an eighty year old may struggle uh, with with five days of, of uh, fasting mimicking diet. But I would say the the majority of people could complete it and uh, could get to the end of the the study, which is about a year long, and uh, and so yeah, we'll see what the result, the cognitive effects are. So you you've given them um, five day fast once a month for a duration of one year. Yes. So um, and and then so when is that study finished? I think uh, they're enrolling now. The very last patients uh and um and so you know within say six to 12 months it should be finished yeah. actually we got a question um that had come in asking that um you know 
uh, someone had asked how they would participate in a type of fasting, this type of fasting study. Uh, are you are you running other studies? Are some of them in the U.S.? Is it only Italy? Um, what are you doing lately? Well, we hope uh, after this is uh, so we published the animal study and we published the the initial uh, I think thirty patients of, from the clinical trial, and uh, so that's out and people can read it. Uh, in cell reports. And um, and so I think once the, the full clinical trial is out, then uh, hopefully uh, we can talk to our colleagues here in, in uh, Los Angeles and, and elsewhere um, and maybe get some funding to do a multi-center study on, uh, on cognition and Alzheimer. Um, obviously, we are, uh, b because the fasting mimicking diet is, in addition to the autophagy, is, is causing a real revolution of the metabolism of the brain so so now all of a sudden uh, the brain is gonna uh, it's forced to use ketone bodies uh, um, and 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 rewire in a sense um so um, so we we are hoping that all this together may be able to do or at least help the drugs or uh, maybe do some some of the things that the drugs are not able to do uh, just because by the time somebody has Alzheimer's, the brain is, is such a uh, advanced stage of of, uh, of dysfunction. Okay, let's go back a little bit to um, the animal models research, um, where you actually found fasting mimicking um, diet cycles reduced neuroinflammation. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think that you know we have been uh, talking about that for. 20 years, uh, and we published, uh, you know, I think it's 2001 uh, a paper suggesting the peroxynitrite uh, was um, was very very toxic, and it was coming from the microglia, and it was killing the neurons, right? So, and, and sort of that went away, and nobody paid too much attention back then. And then some, some uh, maybe around six or seven years ago, this a lot of this started sort of taking more front and center this inflammatory uh, hypothesis. And, and it was interesting in, in our So there is a lot of people now that are saying that it's just not just us anymore. I think, I think back then it was just a few groups, um, but uh, the, the Finch group and, and, and ourselves, and, but now it's a lot of people. And, um, and so I think that uh, it was interesting from our paper because when we, we actually said, well, let's just do what's called RNA-seq. Let's see all the changes that occur without having an opinion. And sure enough, you know, many, many of the changes that occurred uh, in the Alzheimer mouse models uh, were inflammatory. So there is a lot of genes that were turned on and they were indicative of, of inflammation. And then when we did the fasting making diet, many of these were brought back down. So it, it was very interesting, right? Because um, it, uh, it was something that was less biased. It was, didn't really depend on what our opinion was of, of what was going on, but but uh, it, it was showing us hundreds of genes that, that are now increased and they're in the neuroinflammatory domain. And, and many, many that are, of these are, are now back to normal or certainly lowered uh, after the cycle of the fasting making diet. And so now this hypothesis that you know, the, meta the systemic metabolism is of course tightly connected with the brain. And this is not surprisingly, uh, diabetes patients have 75% increased chance of developing Alzheimer's, right? So, and I think a lot of this has been ignored and, and, and to this day is, is viewed as, I think by the neurobiology community is, oh, okay, yeah, this is, you know, these additional things. No, I think it's not additional things. It's about the aging process, the metabolic dysfunction. And, and together, I think that with the brain, you know, damage and inflammation, et cetera, that's, that's where, now you progress to the to the Alzheimer's. So that's that's what it looks like, and and so we we are, we were happy to see that we're going back to exactly this the superoxide peroxynitrite and this maybe in the microglia, maybe some other immune cells in the brain that are now confused and they keep attacking and they're keeping trying to do something that they should not do, and <clears throat> and that's what we we started to we we believe even more now to be at the center of the problem and at the center of the solution. So the focus is, I think, I'm not sure everybody understands um, that process. So I wanna, I wanna delve a little bit into it. Now, there's two things going on. One is depriving calories, restricting calories 
um, actually forces our bodies into ketosis, right? Where we burn energy from fat. Is that fair to say with the fasting? It's not just the calories, it's the type of calories, right? So you want to have low sugar and you want to have low amino acids, right? Low protein, low amino acids, and then high fat. It, it can, you can have high calories and you can still, or relatively high calorie, and you can still get into a ketogenic mode. Yeah. So, so the, the um, hypothesis or the theory behind this is, you know, the natural, we, we usually, glucose fuels our brain, but ketones are an alternative source of fuel for our brains. And so um, would you say like uh, exchanging between those two systems is actually better for our brain health? Um, or should we seek to really be in ketosis for a longer state of time because that's better for our brain health? Or do we know? We don't know, but I think that um, if you look at every other system that we looked at so far, so we look at the pancreas, the liver, the gut, uh, and so I think you see these programs of shrinking and re-expansion that eventually become very sophisticated and able to fix the problem, right? It's almost like it's... it's um, it's a program that was always there to understand how to put the organ back to where it was, right? And it makes sense, right? So you, you get wounded by, by with a knife, you know, 20,000 years ago. Uh, well, you know, you could die or you could survive. And if you survive that, uh, everything gets regenerated, right? Or most of it gets regenerated. So then the question is, well, if it knows how to regenerate all of that, uh, well, is it possible that the brain also um knows how to in at least partially reset regenerate itself so i think that the, the ketone bodies become just a player in that message we're starving this is the moment to shrink the brain doesn't really shrink like all other organs right uh so we know for example the heart can become 41 percent uh, this is all studies by enzo keys 41 percent uh, lower mass during prolonged starvation i mean this is long-term starvation um, the brain doesn't do that, but we, we believe that in that process, it's now starting to change its program, high ketone bodies, lower glucose, using both ketone bodies and glucose as fuel. But that's a part of a, a reset and attempt to look at what's wrong with it and maybe uh, try to um, try to fix it as much as possible. Now, you know, we're still at the beginning. Then the question is, can we induce a, a true repair and rejuvenation, right? And that's more like science fiction right now. But but I think that that certainly set in the stage, like for example, in the pancreas, we, we took the mouse pancreas, the, damage it to the point that it's no longer making insulin. And then we start the FMD cycles. And you know, within a couple of weeks, it's making insulin again, right? Mm -hmm. and the, and whereas the, the control is permanently damaged pancreas, right? So if we could do it in the pancreas in all these other organs, is it possible that we, we would be able to do it in the brain? I don't know, but certainly uh, it's interesting. And, and I think, again, ketone bodies like autophagy are just parts of a very sophisticated program that does much more than do those two things. I think people like to, uh, you know, talk about one specific, you know, uh, mechanism and, and make it the whole story. But but I think it's uh, it's three billion year of, of evolution uh, have, have come up with better than than ketone bodies or autophagy. You know? So you call the prolonged diet a longevity diet. So what do we know about prolonging lifespan um, and fasting? Yeah, well, we know first of all that. Uh, you know, unlike the uh, irrational exuberance, as Greenspan used to say about fasting, uh, you know, fasting like calorie restriction can go either way, could do lots of good, neutral or damage, right? And, uh, and so, for example, we now know the people that skip breakfast. And, you know, if you skip breakfast, you're probably doing 14, 16 hours of, of, of uh, time restricted fasting every night, and they live shorter, right? And this is very consistent, more cardiovascular disease. And, and, and that will assume potentially also maybe more neurodegenerative uh, issues. Yeah, so, so fasting is not necessarily uh, a good thing. And, and we need to find, um, you know, we need to find the, the, the type of interventions that the type of fasting, and I think the fasting-making diet is, is one of them, that can 
make the system younger. We're going to publish on that pretty soon, not, not an Alzheimer patient, but on, on, on regular people. Um, we already publish, well, we're going to publish on mice and people like do the fast making that make you younger. We already publish in mice and makes them live longer. But can you can you actually take a, a mouse of a certain age and would the biological age be reduced by the fasting making diet? And you know, so the indications are uh, both in mice and humans that probably we'll, we will see about the the paper and the demonstration of it. But uh, uh, yeah, so I think that um, you know the the the, the fasting making diet is a is a reasonable, feasible way to achieve the effects of fasting, but a very particular type of fasting for a very defined length right people again they think that oh well maybe i could fast for three weeks well if you fast there is a paper uh, in new england journal of medicine that nobody remembers anymore but that showed that if people were put on a fasting a very severe calorie restriction eventually they enter the thrifty mode their metabolism slow even adjust the per body weight and now you're in trouble right because now you, you went too long and the body reacts by saying, okay, now my, my energy expenditure is going to be reduced. Right. Right? So now your brain, it tells you eat, 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 because something is wrong. I've lost lean body mass. And the interesting thing is the attempt is not to regain the weight. The attempt is to regain the muscle and, you know, and lean body mass lost during that starvation period. Right? So it's a very sophisticated system and we have to be knowledgeable and respectful of it and uh, and i think we're not going there like everybody's just just deciding you know that i'm listening to somebody that until yesterday was a surgeon and uh and i i make the decision that um you know i should fast this way or that way or i should be on a ketogenic diet or i should be on a low carb diet and this is really doing tremendous damage you know and uh yeah. but Walter, i mean there's so much hype over fasting today um how do you know how do you actually know everybody's built differently right and so how do we know what's the right time frame i mean everyone so many people i know are doing intermittent fasting what you talked about skipping breakfast so that you have like a good 12 to 16 hour period of no food but how do we know what's right for us like are there certain things that we should be checking in terms of you know, glucose levels or, you know, cholesterol, I don't know, like, what should we check to understand what's best for us? Or is there a way to do so? Yeah, there is a way to do so. This is why we started two foundation clinics, one in Los Angeles, one in Milan. And I mean, we have a team that includes PhDs and includes physicians. And, and you know, they, they work together, they, they work with the universities that we do clinical trials, right? For example, we're starting a 500 people clinical trial in Southern Italy, um, you know, randomized, and we we have another one uh, with all the patients that come in. Yeah, so these, you know. It, so you would have to participate in a study. I was just look, thinking practicality, you know, practically speaking, is there something I could check every week, you know, something I could wear a monitor or something to know that, oh, wow, this is my but, optimal. This is what I was saying. Yeah, I think that, you know, if you need, if you had a disease, uh, you would go to a doctor, right? You will have that doctor follow you. So um, I guess my point is, yes, you can do lots of things. I wrote several books on it. You know, the, the longevity diet is focused on that. And, uh, and so you can read that. Um, and, uh, and I tried to write the book based on five pillars. So my point was, you know, let's not just focus on epidemiology. Uh, first of all, let's personalize. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you are female and, and you're 82 years old, uh, you're going to do something very different than if you're a male and you're 19. Right. So, uh, but also five pillars, like, you know, clinical studies, epidemiology, basic research, centenarians, like what did the centenarian used to do? So, I think it's certainly not something that you should be explained in two minutes. And, and then again, I think just like the doctor is not something you wouldn't want the, your, your endocrinologist to tell you, oh, well, let me give you a recipe for what you should do uh, to treat diabetes. It's the same way with nutrition and longevity, right? It's, it's, you need to be followed by uh, a, a nutritionist, a registered dietitian uh, that can you know, see where you're at, what you age you are, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, act and adjust, right? So yeah, I recommend people, it's a nonprofit uh, clinic in Los Angeles, uh, Create Cures uh, a Foundation Clinic uh, and, um, you know, be followed by them. And, and, uh, and, and I mean, there are people out there, I mean, I think maybe not too many that are as inexpensive as ours, but I think that uh, there are other ways to get there. But uh, uh, yeah, I encourage people to find out who are the most uh, trained in this area 
and the most trustworthy and then uh, and then go to them and be followed by them you know so when you were referring to the uh, longevity study with mice and you said that the mice actually lived longer how what was the difference in lifespan i think the mean lifespan i think was about 11 percent uh, longer uh but then the 75 percent uh, survival point was more than that it was closer to 20 percent and um yeah but uh, and also of course the the, the health span uh that's where we see the, the even bigger difference you know the whether it's cognition or is uh, frailty or is uh um you know cancer uh yeah so all of those were were improved uh in addition to the to the longevity so what would you recommend to our audience in terms of, I mean, I know you say it's like tailored for individuals, but I mean, should we have a degree of fasting in our lifestyle? Um, like, you know, we, we know there's a, one person um, who's listening in right now brought up um, the 12 lifestyle factors in, that were published in the Lancet study, right? And is asking, well, how how is should fasting be in maybe it should be the 13th right like where does fasting we know exercise um you know diet sleep should fasting be a separate pillar pillar should should everybody consider this is a good way to practice to a certain extent i mean you know don't go too far as you pointed out but should it be in everybody's on everybody's radar to at least practice to a certain extent for for brain health and longevity. Yes, absolutely. So, and, and the number one should be twelve hours of fasting, and twelve hours of feeding, right? So, so eight a.m. to eight p.m. Eat within that time window, or nine to nine, or ten to ten, doesn't matter. As long as you keep it steady and you keep about three or four hours away from the sleep time, right? So, so that's one, right? That, that uh, and uh, and of course you could go to fourteen, sixteen hours, but. For specific reason, for example, for cancer patient, we say 14 hours uh, until the five-year time, uh, cancer-free survival time. Uh, 14 hours because of epidemiological data seems to be a better idea. But other than that, it's 12 hours, right? And then, yeah, I think the fasting making diet, uh, um, the uh, the way it's being clinically tested in many studies now, is probably good to uh, consider at least two or three times a year. Um, now. I will say that you know pretty soon. I think that because again, diabetes is such a risk factor for Alzheimer, and we uh, uh, Eidelberg University of Eidelberg has already published on, on one study on uh, um, on diabetes and uh, fasting making diet worked very well. There is several more uh, we published uh, five years ago on 100 patients that um, did the fasting making diet, and certainly were um, lots of evidence for improvements. Uh, in cardiometabolic uh, risk factors. Yeah, so I think that, that once a University of Leiden um, a study pu is published, um, it's, it's going to be pretty solid evidence that um, the fasting mimicking diet done at least three or four times a year, let's say, for most people that are overweight and obese, and, and they have a certain degree of risk for, for cardiovascular diseases, but also Alzheimer. I think that's probably a good idea. And uh, and together with what I call the longevity diet, right? So and, and what I think most of the epidemiological data now supports, which is a mostly vegan, but not completely vegan, right? The vegans tend to, especially as you get older, right? Particularly, uh, they tend to be protein deficient, maybe uh, having higher levels of, of fractures, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I think a pescatarian, uh, uh, you know, diet that is rich in whole grains, uh, vegetables, legumes. But as you get older, it's got more and more animal protein or vegan protein that have high levels of certain amino acids, which are lacking, like, you know, leucine, methionine, et cetera. And, uh, but you see you're already getting technical, right? And so this is why, yeah. I think, yes, I'm giving you some general ideas, but, uh, but I think that, um, you know, best to, to contact a, a registered dietitian trained, not just any registered dietitian, somebody that that has been trained in the in longevity, healthy longevity. I started at USC, the, the, the program, the first program in the nation for registered dietitian focus mm -hmm. on health span. And so I think uh, any of the students coming out of the USC program, I think are going to be trained at least uh, 
and this idea of I'm not worried. About, I'm not just worried about what's going to happen to you in the next three days or three months, but I'm worried about you all the way until hopefully you make it to a hundred uh, and, and, and longer. Yeah. Which a lot of us will, um, so I'm told. Um, this is a great question that's come in. Um, it, um, this woman is asking, we know that two and three people diagnosed with dementia are women. Do you find different outcomes for men and women for this type of fasting? Thus far, uh, nothing that was so uh, that was very clear whether it was in mice or it was in people uh, but I'm sure we will see that I'm sure that eventually when we have thousands and thousands and now we have hundreds and hundreds of patients that we tested in clinical trials it's not enough to yet to see differences but uh, and even when we analyze male and females we separate it we reanalyze them and we get about the same result and so, so, but I think as we get thousands, then we'll probably start saying uh, some things work less well for women uh, or men. Yeah, so, but we'll how know. how much data do you need, and how how long do we have to wait until you conclude um, whether or not fasting is, you know, a way to stave off Alzheimer's disease? Well, we can already say it if we consider the diabetes, right? So. Diabetes, clearly a major risk factor for Alzheimer, 75% chance uh, increased risk to develop Alzheimer. So clearly, if you go after the, the cardiometabolic uh, risk factors, I mean, it's hard to separate the two. Maybe a mathematician will tell me, no, because we can do that. But yeah, if diabetes and, 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 and metabolic dysfunction is, is at the center of the risk for Alzheimer, then, uh, um, then uh, and, and clearly the nutrition is being implicated in, in Alzheimer risk. Uh, so then I think that, um, yeah, we know that uh, by, uh, by acting on, on, on longevity and particularly on cardiometabolic dysfunction, uh, we should definitely be helping in, uh, um, in Alzheimer prevention or postponement. Don't forget that if we can postpone Alzheimer by five to 10 years, uh, we're gonna, uh, reduce the number the, of, of Alzheimer's patient by health, right? Because uh, people end up, uh, you know, dying of natural causes, and and uh, yeah. So then, and that's, that's a big difference. A, if getting it at seventy versus eighty is a huge difference in terms of quality of life. Yeah. Yeah, or getting it at eighty-five versus never getting it because you know in ninety-one uh, you, you, you're going to die of natural causes, right? So yeah. So, yeah. so I think that's. Uh, the aging, you know, treat aging and treat cardiometabolic dysfunction and making the body uh, more functional um, and, and as young as possible. Uh, I think it's, uh, you can't go wrong. And it's just hard to imagine now, considering what I just said, that that would not affect uh, the incidence of Alzheimer's. Okay, so for healthy people, a lot of us are healthy. We haven't been diagnosed. Um, we may have a family member um, who, ha like myself, who has a mom with Alzheimer's disease. Um, tell us a little bit about how you practice fasting. How should I be thinking about it? Um, you know, is, is how much is too much? How much is not enough? Um, you know, give us a little bit of insight on that. Yeah. So as I mentioned, so 12 hours, uh, uh, I think it's a very good, uh, uh, way to go, uh, the longevity diet and then, um, uh, the, the fasting mimicking diet, uh, at the beginning, uh, two or three times a year, somebody was starting to uh, have a clear cognitive decline, you know, as we've done for the Alzheimer clinical trials. Now, I think we're hoping to soon enough have programs, um, you know, lifestyle programs, you know, and Dale Bredes and another have, have been doing this for a while. And, and so, you know, have lifestyle programs that uh, will you know, include the fasting mimicking diet and everything else where you have a physician and a neurologist uh, uh, following you. And, you know, and, and, and why is that? Well, because again, if you're doing something on a 75 year old and you're making them do the fasting mimicking diet once a month or once every two months, it just, it needs to come with a package where, for example, we do this in the, in the cancer. Cancer has similar problems for different reasons. A cancer patient, because, you know, they lose weight, they lose muscle mass. So then in our programs, we have them make sure that they do uh, training, you know, uh, exercise, they do, uh, you know, uh, muscle training. And, and, and sure enough, we're able to uh, keep them in, in good uh, physical health uh, uh, 
um, uh, and uh, yeah, so then yeah, the, the program needs to be adapted once uh, somebody's older. Uh, but yeah, in your case, you, you, you're younger, and um, and I think uh, you know maybe doing a, the fasting making diet three times a year. Now, you know, we've also been talking to the people that are in the EPOE uh, foundation. Uh, yeah, so so if somebody was, you know, almost I got for EPOE four. So uh, meaning, uh, just to explain to people, that's the Alzheimer's gene. If you have one copy, um, you have an elevated risk. Two copies, you have more so. So yes, yeah. Yeah, so two copies of the EPOE4, right? So then, then the, that's a problem. Okay, no, 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 no worries, you know. But yeah, but start fighting it as early as possible, as as tough in as tough as a manner as possible. So I would say, you know, if I had two copies of the EPOE4, I would just go longevity diet, fasting, making diet, maybe every couple of months. Um, you know, maybe the 12 hours of, you know, make, make it 13 or 14 hours daily. Uh, I wouldn't overdo it because again, then you could get in the opposite, uh, uh, you know, you could start doing uh, damage and nourishment, right? So you start losing, have somebody watch your lean body mass, your muscle mass, your bone density. And um, so you, it's just, I think it's a matter of keeping the equilibrium, keeping everything just enough, but not, not lower than the threshold because if you pass the threshold now you know your immune system and everything else starts not doing well and now you're going to have a bigger problem than the solution you just acquired in now in um the prolon literature you recommend doing consecutive months maybe three fasts um once a month for three months does it have to be sequential or can you pick three months out of the year to say i'm going to do it or are they the the maximum benefits if you do it consecutively month to month yeah so i first of all i separate myself from the company i cannot even mention the the, the name you're you're uh, oh sorry <laughs> you know i'm the founder for disclosure purposes but but i cannot as a, i'm talking as a professor and there's a company and you know and i donate everything to charity by the way yeah it's a non-profit that you that has been created to um really implement the fasting mimicking it's not like you profit. No, no, the, com the company is not non-profit the, the company is a for-profit my part of it which is a large part of it it's all non-profit right so okay all, right. all my part goes to foundation the charity to clinical trials etc et but yeah so um so i think that um the um uh yeah. So then uh, your question was, uh, uh, so is it, do you have to, if you, you're practicing fasting mimicking, is it better to yeah, do yeah. So three, the three cycle? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, um, the trials have almost all been, because of course it, it's difficult to do it, it other ways, but yeah, say three cycles once a month for three months, four cycles once a month for four months. Uh, the Heidelberg one was six cycles once a month for six months. So every trial so far has done it once a month for three months and then wait. Um, so for example, in the first trial that we did at USC, we waited for three months and then we measured again. And you know, 60% of the sort of the beneficial changes were still there. So that's encouraging, but it's suggesting also it's slowly moving away from the effect, right? So you just lost 40% of the effects. So, and in the Southern Italian trial, we're gonna do the fasting making that once every three months. Right, so four times a year, once every three, three months, and um, and we'll see. Right, so this is the first time that we that we do it. Uh, so I, we suspect that it should work um, um, also once every three months, but uh, that's not what has been clinically tested thus far. So so probably you know maybe once a month for three months, and then wait, and then uh, uh, maybe six months later you could do one cycle. You know, so so there yeah. may be the entry practice and then a, a maintenance uh, level right. let's say three times a year I mean I I kind of felt like when I was doing it three days would have been enough but four and five were quite hard do is is there a reason behind the five days is that where we see the maximum benefit yeah I mean your response is unusual right so most of the people suffer for the first three days a little bit and then and then they they're okay and on day four and five they say i could go another two weeks uh because now you're in a fully ketogenic mode right so right. your gene is rewired and everything else and now you're okay 
uh, and most people have a couple of months of reserve, right? So, so uh, yeah, so I think that um, uh, the five days is important. Uh, I, I, three days is probably just beginning to shrink systems and organs and not enough, maybe the autophagy, et cetera, et cetera, just beginning. They might not even beginning lots of cells. Um, and then I think after five days, not only there is a compliance issue, like in your case, uh, but I think there's also the risk of this thrifty mode metabolic switch. Now uh, you, you sense uh, prolonged starvation conditions and you, you lower you your, slow your metabolism down maybe rather than, right. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So the five days seems to be that and the fasting mimicking component. Some people, you know, complain and they say, well, uh, but uh, my sugar spikes in the in the fasting. Mimicking. Everybody's, you know, now it's got devices and they test. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, they, they, they have to appreciate the, you know, in fact, the fasting making that is not a low carb diet. You know, it's it's a high carb, high fat, low sugar low protein right so so and we're trying to achieve all the the things that we're discussing and um yeah so then uh then uh, yeah i urge people to uh, to let us uh you know give us advices if you have them but let us do the the, the science and and don't worry about uh things uh, i mean worry about the clinical trials and the results of the clinical trials and um and the mouse studies and the results of the mouse studies but not so much what happens to the sugar level uh, after you do soup number three. You know? Right. Okay. And when should we check in with you next about the results of a significant trial? When will you know more? It's going to take, well, no, I mean, uh, yeah, the trial, I would say hopefully, you know, within a year, we will have published uh, or, or yeah, the, the trial in Perugia and in Geneva. And then let's see if uh, we start. I mean, it's a, 60 patients, so a relatively small trial, but, yeah. uh, you know, we, we never know. It could start uh, showing some some positive results. We'll see. Great. Thank you so much, Walter Longo, um, for joining us and making the time. We're going to check in with you in a year uh, to, to see what you found um, with those results from Italy. Um, but thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. And I know it's a topic a lot of us are really interested in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if you missed any of that interview, uh, go to beingpatient.com. We always repost these interviews. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter where you can see more. Thanks everyone for watching. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more information on upcoming interviews, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at beingpatient.com. That's B-E-I-N-G-P-A-T-I-E-N-T dot com. And send us any feedback you may have, whether it's someone you want us to interview or any comment about our podcast series. You can do so by emailing info at beingpatient.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm Deborah Kahn.